I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape. Five on Friday, Vaping News Science and Advocacy Report for the 14th of May, 2021. In the news this week, we jump to Queensland, Australia, where their Department of Education aims to, and I quote, inspire creativity, critical thinking, and build resilience in every student to confidently embrace the opportunities of new industries and technologies. But feels now they must lock toilets during school hours to keep kids from using technology-based safer nicotine products. This message goes out to Cresta Richardson, the Queensland Teachers Union president. Hey, dumbass! The Durries are causing all the health problems in smoking. Vaping is not smoking. Vaping is the clean nicotine technology evolution away from durries. You bloody cane toad oxygen thief. I might be a yank, but I know you're bonkers and going to have a shocker when big knobs realize your dog's breakfast idea only moved rugrats to bunk off, a.k.a ditch school to have a cancer stick, a.k.a. a ciggy while doing blockies around your boob, a.k.a. pokey, a.k.a. penal institution. Yes, kids will wag school because it's become a second-by-second assault on their bloody soul. I can see the headlines now. Locked crappers cause kids to bunk off for dirty blockies. What a tool. Moving on to Malaysia, where Malaysian religious leaders are backing a ban to declare a fatwa on the un-Islamic habit known as vaping. Here we go. When faulty logic fails to convince a society, the powers to be step aside and let the religious zealots chastise the growing legions of aficionados. Vaping is not smoking. Vaping is not tobacco and cannot be haram. Besides, with an estimated value of 2.87 billion ringgits last year alone, I guarantee the government is going to regulate and not ban the safer alternative to smoking. You want an example of this? Let's look at New Brunswick, Canada, where the provincial government on May 11th introduced amendments to the Tobacco and Electronic Cigarette Sales Act, which is gonna become effective January 4th of 2022, and vape shops will need to buy a $100 license for each and every one of the 40 vape shops in the province. And what are they going to spend the license generated $4,000 on? Well, they're going to spend it on the Department of Health because the funds have been allocated for public education on the prevention and protection to help reduce all substance use, including through vaping. Meanwhile, in Saskatchewan, the convenience store industry is crying foul arguing that the Canucks trying to get a 2-4 should be allowed to get flavored tobacco harm reduction products without being forced to make another stop on the way home. Unfortunately, the kerfluffle will fall on deaf ears since the laws were changed to protect the ankle biters who said they got their vapes from the convenience stores. Did they really? Probably not. They probably got them from the same place that they get their pencil crayons and their whale's tail. Well, since the law is now law, good luck trying to get any politician to listen to you. They're too busy listening to the 44% of the people who want a complete ban on all vaping products. Seriously. If the polys don't listen to the 56% of the people 
who say that there's already too many regulations, why do you think you can get them to reverse a law that they just got done passing? Uh, moving on. Moving on to science. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The pursuit and application of knowledge and understanding based on actual evidence. Objective observation, measurements and data, factual evidence. Save the day, Galileo. What does science say about vaping? Electronic cigarettes are more effective than nicotine replacement therapies for smoking cessation. There's a shocker. Smoking costs the United States $300 billion a year in direct medical costs a.k.a. medical and pharmaceutical industry profits and generates $200 billion a year in taxes? Well, now, since Americans pay for their own health care, smoking actually costs the government nothing while generating $500 billion every single year. No wonder the government, alongside the medical and pharmaceutical industries, are attacking the safer alternative product, while allowing combustible, combustible tobacco to be sold everywhere. Meanwhile, smoking kills more people than HIV, illegal drug use, alcohol, motor vehicles, and firearm-related injuries combined. 480,000 deaths in the United States each and every single year is caused by tobacco combustion. Smoking causes 30% of all cancer deaths. And 16 million Americans suffer every single day from a disease caused by smoking. 87% of lung cancer deaths, 32% of coronary heart disease, 79% of COPD deaths are directly linked to smoking combustible tobacco. 100,000 babies have died from sudden infant death syndrome, low birth weight, and other problems resulting from maternal and parental smoking. In fact, type 2 diabetes, blindness, erectile dysfunction, ectopic pregnancy, hip fractures, colorectal cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, fertility issues, orofacial clefts are all caused by smoking combustible tobacco. But the government is not doing a single thing about all of these preventable illnesses and deaths. What's the government focused on? The government's focused on the technological solution that would eliminate or at least significantly reduce all of these diseases and deaths. It's no wonder why the American Lung Association, the American Cancer Society, the American Medical Association, and countless other public health organizations are fighting against vaping, fighting to severely limit or ban the product that has not killed any adults, but every day keeps converting hundreds of smokers into ex-smokers. Combustion of tobacco is the enemy, not nicotine. Nicotine is as benign as caffeine. I know I've said this before. Here's the article where I got it from. And according to Discovery Magazine, nicotine is the most unlikely wonder drug ever to be reviled by society. Yes, benign nicotine can be addictive like caffeine, but it is also an effective drug for relieving or preventing a, a variety of neurological disorders, including Parkinson's disease, cognitive impairment, Tourette's syndrome, 
schizophrenia, and even ADHD. In fact, it is impossible to addict laboratory animals to nicotine that is divorced from the byproducts of combustion. So it does have a mildly pleasant effect. Oh, yeah, man. There's so much more in the actual scientific articles, so let's quit beating around the bush. Ain't nothing to it but to get into it. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, here's our first article for today. Down in Queensland, Australia. They're going to actually put a padlock on the crappers to keep kids from vaping. Need I remind these administrators that whenever I was growing up as a kid and they had teachers stationed outside of the bathrooms to prevent kids from smoking because there were no vapes back then, you know what the kids did? Do you? Do you have any clue what the kids are going to go do? The kids are going to go do what the kids are going to go do. And back in my day, the kids that were smoking or wanted to go smoke, they would just simply skip school altogether so they can go and enjoy their cigarette. So they can go get their little fix to get their little high. You honestly think by padlocking the restrooms, you're actually going to change these kids' behavior? Are you serious? How could you be so obtuse? This is not going to stop the majority of the teens that are going and doing this behavior. The kids that have the inclination to go and do this so they can go get their fix, so they can go get their high or whatever, are going to go and do it anyway. What a tool. How can these people that are supposed to be in charge of teaching the next generation of kids how to be successful in life be so ridiculous in their methodology to change their behavior? Maybe they didn't teach enough psychology courses and maybe they didn't take enough child psychology classes when they were going to become an administrator to actually learn what motivates children and what doesn't motivate children. Mm -hmm. And maybe you need to realize that by simply taking these draconian measures, you're not actually going to change anybody's behavior. Locking the bathrooms isn't going to work. Perhaps if you put a teacher in the bathroom, or at least in the entrance to the bathroom, they would occasionally step inside to make sure that none of these kids are doing that. Well, maybe you might have the influence on a couple of them, but by simply locking the bathrooms down altogether, you accomplish nothing. How ridiculous can you possibly get? And they say that the practice has been backed by the state teachers union because all these teachers are just as ignorant and just as stupid. However, some experts have said attention should be paid to how liquid nicotine is getting out there in the first place. Seriously? They're doing like most of the kids my age did when they were doing it. They were stealing from their parents. And their parents were totally unaware of it. Even if they kept it locked. The kids will sneak access to things if they want to sneak access to them. Kids are curious and go through a phase where they push the limits and try and get away with as much as they can get away with. Once they get it out of their system, though, guess what? Hopefully by that point, they've developed enough of morals and integrity to make the right choices. But there's nothing that you can do that's going to force them to change their behaviors. Kids are going to do what kids are going to do. 
And lying to them is even worse, which is what's happening in the United States. Kids that are caught with vapes in schools, you know what they're doing? They're forced to go to classes that are offered by the local health community. Mm -hmm. Even around here in Pittsburgh, UPMC is offering the respiratory anesthesiologists and the respiratory departments are going around teaching kids how bad vaping is for you. And they just published an article recently today about how there is no scientific studies out there saying that vaping is safe or anything else. There are no studies about vaping. It's literally a quote in the local paper. And it's all a bold-faced lie. Why are you lying to our children? Oh, are you in the tobacco company's pockets? Because tobacco products will always be for sale in this country. So what are you going to do? Take the safer alternative product off the market. Mm Mm-hmm. So that you can keep getting COPD patients, huh? Ignorant bastards. Moving on. Let's take a look at Malaysia. We're just talking about Malaysia. From Kuala Lumpur, we had an article last week about the Malaysian vape industry and how they're begging the government for regulations so that they can have a legalized process where they can get products that are taxed and approved by the government for sale so that these small business owners don't have their entire life savings confiscated in a raid by the government Well, here we have another article. When you are faced with not being able to beat somebody based upon science, well, then you got to go after them with the religious zealots and go after them based on ideology. When you don't have science to back you up, then, well, we need to use religion to get people to do what we want. And that's what's going on right now. Here's a beautiful article on Arab News Today. Arabnews.com, un-Islamic vaping catches fire in Malaysia amid government backlash. Mm Mm-hmm. The Malaysian e-cigarette outlet Vape Empire, customers kick back and puff out thick or aromatic clouds of vapor in funky flavors like horny mango and creamy suckers banana anna. Vaping is soaring in popularity in Malaysia, the largest e-cigarette market in the Asia-Pacific region. But authorities are threatened to ban the habit for health reasons, a move that has sparked anger from growing legions of aficionados. Because we have science behind us proving the efficacy of this product to get people to give up smoking deadly combustible tobacco it is more effective than any nicotine replacement therapy out on the market today so why is the pharmaceutical industry attacking it oh because it's going to attack their coffers and the government they're making a boatload of taxes on tobacco products and in the united states they don't have to pay for any of the health care consequences of it in fact It makes the politicians look good when people have jobs to go to. So all the people that are getting sick from it, that's not really a problem to the politicians because they're making money on it hand over fist. The medical industry and the pharmaceutical industry are making a boatload of cash on the countless sick people that smoking generates for them every single day and for every single pack of cigarettes that's sold the government make is making a boatload of tax money that they get to go and spend on golf courses for their campaign donors so the hands are washing each other left and right but the sick people that are suffering they don't care about them at all Don't let these idiots bamboozle you into thinking that they actually care about their constituents. 
The only ones that they care about are the campaign donors. Or haven't you caught on to that yet? Look at what these politicians say when they're running for office and look at what they do while they're in office. Or you don't care because they're not running for office and you're too busy with other things like mowing your lawn. Hmm? Are you that complacent in society and that accepting of everything you see and hear on TV to believe it's all true? They're lying to you every single day. And I can pull up countless articles showing you how they're lying. And they know that they're lying, but they have an agenda. Well, here we go. According to Arab News, vaping is un-Islamic. Mm-hmm. And Malaysian religious leaders this month have declared a fatwa on the un-Islamic habit. But it remains to be seen whether the, the decree will dampen enthusiasm. Listen, I understand for the Muslims, tobacco is considered a fatwa. So they're not supposed to be smoking. But from firsthand experience, let me tell you, once you are hooked on combustible tobacco, you don't want to give it up. You hate the idea of giving it up. And every time you try to give it up, it is like hell on earth. Every minute that goes by, you just want another cigarette. It's part of being an addict. But you know what? When I found vaping, I had no problem giving it up. None whatsoever. And if the product is 95% safer, why wouldn't you try to convince society to take up the safer alternative, even if it is a habit for them for the rest of their life? You could eliminate 95% of the harm caused by combustible tobacco. Well, Malaysian religious leaders are now pushing for a ban in Malaysia on vaping. And the vape industry is obviously like, listen, just regulate it. Don't ban it. Well, with an estimated value just last year of 2.8 billion ringgits, it's not going anywhere. Politicians only care about money. They're a bunch of greedy bastards. And I don't care what religious leader is going to go to them and tell them this. They're going to do like they do with you and me. The politician is going to tell the religious leader what they want to hear. But when it comes time to actually passing the resolution, they're not going to see any of this ban going through. There is going to be regulation in the vape industry in Malaysia. It's inevitable. Moving on, let's take a look at New Brunswick, Canada, where amendments are aimed to address youth vaping. Mm -hmm. So what did they decide to do in the amendments? Well, they decided to implement a $100 license for every single tobacco vape shop in the province. There's a whole 40 shops in the province. 40 for the area of New Brunswick, Canada. Mm -hmm. So they're going to generate, I did the simple math here. I mean, 40 shops, $100 each. They're going to generate $4,000. What are they doing with this $4,000 that's going to address youth vaping? The Department of Health is allocating funds for public education on the prevention and protection to help reduce all substance use including that from vaping. Hmm. So, unlike most of the other news that we read, a $100 license, even if it's an annual license, it seems like it's an affordable thing for a little shop to be able to afford. Considering what everything else costs in society, well, it says here, anytime changes are made to legislation, we must always measure the potential burdens against the common good and the health of the public, said Shepard. We believe the education and safety of New Brunswickers is crucial, and we are proud to see the legislative collaboration on this important 
file. So obviously somebody knows the benefits of the safer harm reduction product in society. And he's actually going through with it. Wow. Oh man. I have to applaud. We actually have a politician somewhere in the world that actually cares about the health outcomes of the society that he represents. Wow. Makes me want to move to New Brunswick, Canada. Unfortunately, with only 40 shops in the entire province, I'd have to make sure there's one down the street. Moving on. Not everybody in Canada is happy right now. We've been talking about the last couple of weeks about the in Saskatchewan, how they passed the amendment to the tobacco regulations up there. The convenience store industry caught on to it. And now they're not happy because they can only sell tobacco flavored electronic cigarettes in their stores. And they know how many of those tobacco flavors they actually sell on a regular basis. I mean, what year is this? They have computerized inventory management systems that tell them exactly how many of each product to order every two weeks or every week when they place their order, right? Because they don't want to run out. That's called a missed market opportunity if you run out of something. So they're a little upset right now because they know flavors are what drive adults to use electronic cigarettes because it's the flavor profile once they find it that truly empowers them to give up their deadly combustible tobacco habit well they're going around and complaining to the legislatures about this and they're saying straight up well you're just going to make it harder for adults to quit smoking if you're forcing them to go and only buy the flavors from the vape shops, you're essentially making the vape shops a flavor monopoly. Very interesting perspective on the, on the issue. I honestly think that they have a legitimate complaint there. When is the government allowed to create a monopoly in society? Isn't that frowned upon in every civilization all around the globe? even though it's happening every single day in the United States. Just take a look at the cable companies in this country and how they have a monopoly. Even though they say they don't, we know that they really do because guess what? What percentage of the American population has more than one internet provider available to them, more than one cable provider to them? Hmm? They all wash each other's hands and they say, you have that town, I'll take this town. You have that town, I have this town, and we won't expand into each other's towns. That way, neither one of us can technically be accused of having a monopoly, even though they do all across the country. But that's a different topic. I'm not going to get moving into that. As it stands here, the convenience store industry in Saskatchewan is complaining to the government that they want to be able to provide the safer alternative product to their customers because that is the definition of what they are. They're convenience stores for the purposes of giving convenience to their customers. And it is not fair for the vapors in Saskatchewan to be forced to stop at the convenience store to pick up their 2-4 for the weekend so they can go drink. For those of you not familiar, 2-4, 24 bottles, case of beer on the way home. It's not fair to force the consumer to make more than one stop on the way home. They're going to have to stop at a vape shop in order to get their flavors if they don't want tobacco flavor. Who the hell quits smoking and wants tobacco flavors? I know there's people out there. I have a friend of mine that is like that. When I wanted to quit, I wanted to have nothing to do with tobacco 
or tobacco flavors turned my stomach. And I know flavors are subjective. Everybody has their own preferences. Some people like the reminder of it, and they need that reminder to ease their transition because some people truly love the flavor of tobacco. Even though modern day tobacco isn't tobacco, I think I'm going to be doing a video on that soon. Moving on. Let's take a look at a U.S. study analyzing electronic cigarette use behaviors of vapors in Maryland. This is pretty interesting. They took a look at 100 daily exclusive e-cigarette users and 50 non-users in Maryland between 2015 and 2017 and interviewed them. Most daily exclusive e-cigarette users were male men, white former smokers who used mods and tanks and vaped an average of 365 puffs per day with a standard deviation of 720. Huh? How can you have a negative number of puffs per day? Anyway, maybe that's just my ignorance showing. A third of users first vaped within the first five minutes of waking up in the morning. That means two thirds of users did not vape within the first five minutes of waking up in the morning. Interesting how they present the data. 56% vaped throughout the course of the day. Okay. E-liquid consumption ranged from five to 240 milliliters per week with a mean of 32.5 milliliters with nicotine concentration ranging from zero to 24 milligrams per milliliter and a median of three reported the researchers. The findings also highlighted the vapors were more likely to report wheezing, whistling and hypertension than controls. However, the finding was not statistically significant. Moreover, given that most vapors were ex-smokers, it would be hard to determine whether these symptoms were a result of vaping or the previous smoking patterns. Researchers also found that most of the vapors had no intention of quitting. People need their nicotine. People need their nicotine. If they're using nicotine to deal with life, let them have their nicotine. And we'll get to why at the end of this news article. However, electronic cigarettes are more effective than nicotine replacement therapies for smoking cessation. Another recent study aiming to evaluate the effectiveness of electronic cigarettes and smoking cessation tools in comparison with traditional NRTs confirmed that quitting rates tend to be higher in people who use nicotine containing e-cigarettes. We talked about this before. The one study shows that it's five times more effective at getting people to quit smoking than traditional patches, gums, lozenges, and sprays. Wonder what is in this that differentiates it from all those other things. Hmm. Might be the combination of the fact that you have the hand to mouth action, you get the nicotine delivery and you get the flavors. Wow. It's shocking, isn't it? Seems common sense to me. Why are they having such a hard time understanding that? I don't know. But they do have a lovely ability. Everybody in public health has a lovely ability to chastise electronic cigarettes. Think about why. Think about the reasoning. Why would they chastise the safer alternative product? Product has already been proven to be at least 95% safer. In some circumstances, this can be 99% safer than smoking combustible tobacco, right? Why is it that these public health figures lose sight of what the real problem is in today's society? Well, I'm not going to let them do that. I'm here to talk about them right now. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Fast Facts. Diseases and deaths. More than 16 million Americans are living with disease caused by smoking. Not by vaping, by smoking. 
Every single person that dies because of smoking, at least 30 people live with a serious smoking-related illness. Mm Mm-hmm. More money for the pharmaceutical industry to make. More money for the healthcare industry because the more patients that they have. Smoking causes cancer, heart disease, stroke, lung disease, diabetes, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which includes emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Smoking increases the risk for tuberculosis, certain eye diseases, problems of the immune system, including rheumatoid arthritis. I'm not going to go through this whole list. I already talked about it in the beginning of this news report. There's no point in beating a dead horse because nobody seems to give a shit anymore. Health effects of cigarette smoking. The data's here. It's been here. We've known about it for 50 years. But the product's never going to go away. They made a deal. That's the whole idea of the master settlement agreement. Hmm? They sat down with big tobacco executives and said, you guys are spending too much. We're spending too much. Let's come to a deal. Uh Uh-huh. And the part of the deal was make it incredibly impossibly hard for anybody to compete against us, no matter what. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're taking the safer alternative product and they're trying to bury it and shovel it in every little corner and crevice and discredit its effectiveness because it would mean the end of all that funding. $500 billion every year in the United States alone. They don't want that money to go anywhere. And that's exactly what this would do. It would eliminate all of it. If it got everybody to quit smoking and all those sick people weren't sick anymore. American Lung Association, why are they always advocating against regulations? They're only worried about their own self-interest. The health of their charitable organization. They don't really give a shit about American lung health. We'll get into that I'm not going to be into the beating it into the conspiracy theory section, but it is quite obvious in Florida, they just passed a law, not a good law, but everything's settled in Florida. There's nothing to argue about anymore. The vape regulations are set out. They already have an enforcement policy set up. They already have the licensing registration requirements. Everything's all settled. American Lung Association doesn't like that. Because now they have no reason to go city to city to try and change the laws. If they want to fight it, they have to fight it on the state level. And then they would have to be fighting against somebody else that could now gather up all their and muster all their resources to fight it at one single location. Instead of having to constantly jump around and deal with things after the fact because they were literally going from city to city and not making hay about it until after they won. So somebody pointed out to me earlier this week that it's a good thing that that the laws passed in Florida the way they did, even though they aren't pretty. And if you're a vape shop in there, good luck trying to keep up with the, you know, regulatory requirements of it, but it's at least possible. I've had so many people tell me different things about, you know, oh, you should be glad the way it is. It could be worse. We're glad. We won. We fought. You didn't really win. Because every street corner you go to, you can find a cigarette. You can find all different kinds of cigarettes. A whole wall of cigarettes. How far do you have to travel to find a vaping product? Can't get it through the mail anymore. I know. They didn't actually implement the regulation quite yet because they haven't figured it out yet. And you can get it through private courier. But every year, the costs keep going up and up and up and up. At what point are they going to stop? They're not. They can't argue about tobacco anymore because the master settlement agreement settled it. Just like in Florida. Their vaping regulations are not settled. The American Lung Association of Florida has nothing to do. Well, maybe they need to focus on what the real problem is because it isn't this. It isn't vaping. And it isn't the nicotine that goes in vaping either. Let me remind you of some beautiful press that got published out there because, oh, they just realized that, oh, I don't know, about seven years ago, 
they did some research and they came to find out that maybe these um, nicotine replacement therapy products sh shouldn't be prescription only. Maybe we should just sell them over the counter because people need easy access to the safer alternative to give up their combustible tobacco habit. So what do they do? Well, they published a bunch of information and a bunch of news back in the day in 2015. It says, is nicotine all bad? Scientists questioned if a daily dose of the well-known alkaloid is a benefit. Well, that's not actually what this one says. This one says, is it as benign as caffeine? Well, I got another article published in Discovery Magazine that says that it's not only benign, but beneficial. People need the nicotine in their system. It actually helps deal with lots of different issues. But we'll get to that in a minute. This one was published in 2015. It says, since he ditched Marlboro Lights five years ago, Daniel's Fix is a fruit-flavored nicotine gum that comes in a neat pop-out strip. He gets through 12 to 15 pieces a day and says that he has packets of the stuff stashed all over the place. But he doesn't see himself as a nicotine addict. And he didn't get chastised for being a nicotine addict. Because he wasn't vaping, he was chewing gum that has nicotine in it. And doctors don't have a problem telling their patients to go and chew the nicotine gum. But they have a problem telling their patients to go and use a vaporizing device that administers nicotine. That's it. That's all that's in here. We have propylene glycol, and we have vegetable glycerin, and nicotine if you choose to use it, and flavoring. That's all that goes into it. They have more ingredients in that gum than e-liquid has that people use to vape. But most people aren't going to tell you about that. Because most people don't care. The people that you hear beating the drum every week have a financial invested interest in it. Well, I don't. I don't own a vape shop. I do this because I want to empower other people to be able to quit the way I did. I tried all their bullshit. I tried patches. I tried the gum. I tried the prescription pills. You know, the ones that make you suicidal or a certain percentage of the user suicidal. I tried all of them. And sometimes I actually tried multiple ones at the same time. And none of it worked. It was all a waste of money. But I picked this up and it worked. And it keeps me off of them. That's what they're fighting with all these bands. They didn't have a problem with nicotine back then when they were pushing for the general release of it from behind the pharmacy counters to in front of the pharmacy counters. But now all of a sudden nicotine's bad because it addicts kids. Well, you can go into the grocery store and pick up nicotine gum sitting out on the counter, sitting on the shelf, in the aisle. They have lozenges and sprays. Nicotine's not being protected there from the children, but they're going to attack this because the kids are using these jewel devices to get their fix, to get their high. I'm waiting for somebody to have enough balls to look at these people and say, you should be glad that they're using that instead of smoking the death sticks, the cancer sticks. There's a reason they're called death sticks. But I'll tell let you take a look at this later. Is nicotine all bad? No. It's as benign as caffeine. And in actuality, Depending on what scientist you talk to, it's not only benign, it is beneficial. And there's a certain percentage of the population that needs to take nicotine. They just did a study not too long ago when this whole COVID situation hit. They came to realize, wow, 
nicotine users, be it from cigarette smoking or from vaping or from people that tried to quit smoking and were using a patch, were significantly underrepresented in the number of COVID cases. So it had a protective effect against the virus. But that didn't get very much hay. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the World Health Organization came down on them for doing this study and publishing it right now. Oh, you can't do that. What if you're wrong? So you have to wait until after you're done doing all the research before you even talk about what you're doing the research about. What are they afraid of? Hmm? Oh, where does their funding come from? College classes taught me, follow the money. If you have a question why things don't seem to add up, follow the money. Where's, where's all these groups getting their money from? Plenty of videos out there. I already talked about that. Here we go. Nicotine, the wonder drug. This notorious stimulant may enhance learning and help treat Parkinson's, treat schizophrenia, and other neurological diseases. Every drug of addiction must have its day. Morphine remains one of the most potent painkillers ever discovered. Cocaine's chemical cousin lidocaine is still used by physicians and dentists as an effective local anesthetic. Even demon alcohol, when taken in moderation, cuts the risk of heart attacks, osteoporosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and a hodgepodge of other ailments. Now comes nicotine, perhaps the most unlikely wonder drug ever reviled. If dozens of human and animal studies published over the past six years are born out of large clinical trials, nicotine freed at last of its noxious host tobacco and delivered instead by chewing gum or transdermal patch or vaporized state in an electronic cigarette may prove to be a weirdly improbably effective drug for relieving or preventing a variety of neurological disorders, including Parkinson's disease, mild cognitive impairment, Tourette's, and schizophrenia. It might even improve attention and focus enough to qualify as a cognitive enhancer. Oh yeah, it's long been associated with weight loss with few known safety risks. Although in truth, few safety studies of the increasingly popular electronic cigarettes have yet been published. Well, this was published in 2014. There have been thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of studies been done on the subject matter. And for those people that truly want to look for the information, it's out there. There's a reason why New Zealand and the UK have websites listing the hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of studies proving the safety and effectiveness of using electronic cigarettes as a smoking cessation tool. Hmm. It says in here, nicotine is not only for that purpose, but also potentially to help alleviate the signs, symptoms, and the disease progression of all these other neurological conditions. Tweaking the brain. When I was growing up, it was called Better Living Through Chemistry. Mm -hmm. And it was a catchy thing that my chemistry teacher taught me in high school. Better Living Through Chemistry. There's a reason why you need to learn this stuff. Because once you learn it and you understand it, you can incorporate that with all other facets of society and all other facets of life. And it's true. Better living through chemistry. You find the chemistry of nicotine and you apply it in a unique fashion, which is exactly what happened when they developed the electronic cigarette. People had tried sprays. They tried the gums. They tried all these different techniques and there's a reason why they all have a low success rate because they weren't able to incorporate the key factor, which is the flavors. Vaping works because it's the perfect combination of everything. And just like cigarette use, 
is not the same for every single cigarette smoker out there. Vaping can be fully customized to the needs of the each individual user who's giving up their habit. You use as much nicotine as you need to use. And there's plenty of other studies out there that show its effectiveness, and it's even being used to treat depression. And it's also shown clinically that there are a predominantly more significant users of nicotine products because it is their coping mechanism. It is a developed coping mechanism throughout the course of their life. So why deny somebody their ability to cope with society? And I've even seen the flip side of that being argued down in Australia right now, where they're saying, well, these teenagers need to learn with things like sadness and depression and, and how to handle these feelings. And if you let them use, you know, nicotine to deal with it, then they'll never learn to develop a way to deal with these things in life. I don't care what you want to do. Some people just need a little additional solutions in their life. There's going to be a percentage of society that was always going to need pharmacological assistance dealing with things in life. You don't chastise the psychiatrist and the psychologist for wanting to incorporate pharmacological solutions into their treatment, do you? Well, this is the one thing that's consistent no matter where you go. Every single article will talk about how we need more evidence. We need more evidence. We need more evidence. At what point in history is it going to be enough evidence? I'm not saying that we need to stop once we have enough evidence, but at what point can you definitively come up with a recommendation so that everybody on the face of the earth can follow the same recommendation and put to rest all these people that are bold face lies walking around with their bold face lies? because of the misconception that this is a harmful product. It can be a harmful product, but each individual person out there needs to choose whether it's going to be beneficial or harmful. And it is wrong of society and wrong of government to force choices on people. The old adage of you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink it. There's a reason behind it. And just like in Australia, them padlocking the bathrooms is not going to change what kids are going to do. We've seen countless videos and countless other situations where kids that want to drink are going to drink. Kids that want to smoke are going to smoke. Yeah, you can teach them, but you can't make them drink the water if they're not going to drink the water. So that wraps up the Vaping News Science and Advocacy Report for today, the 14th of May, 2021. I really want to thank you guys for watching. I am so looking forward to moving. This is probably going to be the last news report. It is going to be the last news report you're going to see with this background on here. If I need to get my studio painted, I have the acoustic solutions to get mounted this weekend. And going to be moving everything from here into there to get established. Which means, starting next week, you're going to see multiple videos posted on this channel every single week. I want to be able to do this full time because I truly feel passionate about how this is an effective solution that everybody should have access to. And I thank you guys for watching. And I'll catch you next week. Have a great day.